Yes, so to begin this uh, first chapter of our day, um, we're uh, just really looking forward to having everyone here to envision the future of biotech and biotech devices. But before we can launch into the future, we need to understand the present. And so we're going to have uh, speakers uh, from a variety of disciplines and departments and places talk to us about their work in this field to inform and inspire the second half of the day where we will then begin prototyping and envisioning uh, kind of this really crazy future that um, you'll be hearing about all day. Um, so to begin this, uh, we'll be, uh, the first chapter of the day is synthesize. And so uh, this is using biological systems to produce things. And so there's this subtle shift that we've been having in how we make things uh, actually going from making to harvesting. And we see this now even with 3D printers where we upload the file and then eight hours later we come back and we harvest our print. But we're limited just to maybe a little bit of plastic or a laser cut piece of wood. And so we're gonna hear some really great speakers that are questioning or uh, pushing forward, well, what if we can um, create things that can create anything? And so to begin that, uh, I would like to invite our first speaker up. This is Rachel Suhu Smith. She is a student in a PhD student in the uh, Media Lab in Neri Oxman's Mediated Matter Group. And yeah, welcome. Awesome. Thanks, Jack. Let's see. Awesome. And here we go. Uh, good morning, guys. Yeah, um, so my name is Rachel. Um, I'm a PhD student. I work here at the Media Lab. And um, one of my main goals today is to, in this sh short 10 minutes, tell you a little bit about a field that I belovedly called hybrid living materials. Um, this could also be known as engineered living materials, biohybrids, wearable biotech. It fits snugly in um, this conference of what we're talking about today. And um, one thing in this um, theme of synthesize that I want you to focus on in this is that in between all the exciting um, bio and digital, there's also materials, which I think of as kind of the underdog, but um, it's there. It might seem um, boring and inert, but um, it's something that we think about a lot on a daily basis. Um, when we're synthesizing. And so, to start things off, I thought uh, it would be morning and you guys could have a pop quiz and I could judge how nerdy the audience is. Does anybody know what we're looking at here? You can scream it out. Yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. This is like my favorite scene because it's the dawn of humanity, this proto-human, um, monkey has um, like sat in this pile of bones for a long time and has just had this um, giant epiphany that this is not just a bone, this is also a tool. Um, and this is like the, the cradle of humanity, it's now a utensil and a weapon and a signal and everything else. Um, and although that is fiction, I think that's happened many times throughout history. Um, we've gone um, in the last um, hundreds and more years through a Bronze Age and an Iron Age. We've found plastics and glass and we found more and more sophisticated um, processes through them. So we've got these skyscrapers now and these tiny silicon chips and even this new kind of like black mirror of virtual um, material and virtual reality as well. Um, but I don't think we've depleted our physical world yet. Um, I think that if we were to ask someone what the next revolution of materials could be, um, it's to think of a living cell as a material. Um, and if we take this um, to actually like break down what a cell is and what it has to offer us, you can see that um, cells, first of all, are extremely good at harvesting energy from their environment and then using that energy um, to be motile. They're these little agents. They can also use that energy to replicate and grow. Um, their surfaces are jam-packed 
with all these little signal receptors and things and sensors for their environment. Um, and this module also has an interior that can produce all these metabolic agents. Pretty much we have programmability for making DNA, proteins, antibodies, and a lot of metabolic chemicals. Um, and if you think of this one little agent as a material, we can go pretty far with it. Um, but what's the catch? Um, there's always a catch. Um, and our engineering requirements say that for engineerable materials, we need some level of control over these things. We need um, our material to be um, repeatable, designable, and standardizable. And that's where we're having kind of um, our, our next big hurrah in, in the materials world is trying to create some control over this. Um, and luckily, there's a lot of people doing it. Um, so in no particular order, I don't mean to offend anyone. <laughs> this should have been kind of floating bubbles, but um, in the last 20 years, we've had people in the world of synthetic biology start to um, relate these cells to computers and program with them. We've had people in regenerative medicine for the first time put cells into additive manufacturing platforms and print with them and really take that idea of them as a material to a next level. Um, and even let them grow emergently afterward. And then um, we have what we now call these biohybrid and hybrid living materials. And a few quick um, examples of these, some of them you'll see today, are biobots, um, things that have used cells to be motile. Um, and um, there's also things, large built structures like these cellulose and myocelium um, structures that can be grown and if they're still alive can begin to sense as part of a building. Um, some other of my favorites are um, biotextiles um, and this could be anything from Hiroshi's group to embedded bacteria and threads um, and then um, I think it's been over a decade since this has happened, but um, these uh, biological photographs are using the logic gates in E. coli um, so that each cell can act kind of like a pixel on a plate and decide whether or not, based on the rules, um, to produce ink or not. And not only can it do photographs, but it can do edge detection and a lot of other um, kind of levels of logic that we usually only see in digital. So um, with that, I want to bring you to some of the work we do in the Mediated Matter group with a lot of collaborators as well. Um, and that's how we approach this idea of hybrid living materials. Um, and again, to go back to synthesis, we play with that idea a lot. And um, we often do not assign who is the maker. Um, we let that drift between anything from a silkworm, a bacteria, um, the computer designer, or the biologist. And um, we like to kind of break through what people assume can be made um, and how it is made. And with that, the next um, pop quiz of the day is, um, how do you think this was synthesized? Or what is it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you probably already know some of you. But um, this was um, where our story starts. We do a lot of 3D printing in our group. And this is a multi-material inkjet 3D printer. So um, we're working off the basis that we can use tiny drops of ink to have heterogeneous material distribution throughout an object, which is something that um, is fairly novel in our material history. Um, and there's a couple more example of these objects. Um, what's beautiful about them is this printer has about 16 micron um, control in one dimension. And it also allows you not only to have different materials in one unified object, but grade your material properties continuously throughout, which up to this point is something we've only really seen in natural constructs. And although this is biomimetic, we're starting to wonder how can we make this not just um, mirror biology, but have some kind of functional interface with it? Can we use these things that lo look a lot like biology to actually communicate? Um, and that was the goal of Vespers. It was a group of death masks, if you're wondering what these shapes are. Um, and our idea was to take this abiotic material and by the end of the project have something that um, 
where the, both the um, digital design platform and the abiotic materials we print with were having a, uh, some kind of interface or active communication with the living cells. Um, and how we did this was threefold. We actually worked in the area of the software, the printer, and the cell um, to create the system as a whole um, that could um, be programmable. And yes, so this is to start. Our software um, was a custom software made for the printer. And um, the only thing you really need to know about this is that um, what we're able to do here, I'll play that again, um, is um, create um, a bitmap where at every single point in 3D space, we can say if a material does or does not exist there and how much of it. Um, before, we were only using that for visual materials like um, a color or transparency or opacity. But our next idea was to use that for a chemical signal to say at any given point in this 3D object, we want a small chemical inducer, as we call it. And that's something that um, synthetic biologists have used for a long time as a way to communicate with bacteria and turn on or off a gene. And so what we're doing now is putting that into a three-dimensional object and giving it a spatial kind of information set of where to turn on or off a gene. Um, then. Of course, you have your programmable material. You need your programmable life. Um, these are our E. coli cells. They're our trusty workhorses. And for most of the um, visuals that you're seeing, there, it's actually a very simple circuit, Puck19, which has a lax Z and produces a blue pigment when the gene turns on. Um, there you go. And so. Um, what's beautiful about these um, biological circuits, as many of you know, is that um, right now we're working on this huge library of biological and uh, engineered gene circuits um, that different um, labs are producing. So really, once you have a platform where you can make both, both of these things, you can um, benefit from a library of colors, products, and even bioactive um, materials that um, you can make with cells. So, this is Vespers 3. Um, what we did here, this is a 3D print that came off the printer. Um, it's a time lapse of about 24 hours um, that this mask sat in a, a humidity controlled incubator. And you can start to see that um, the mask has embedded in it the chemical signals um, necessary to tell the bacteria where to produce color. The bacteria are living across the entire mask, um, so you just can't see them in some areas where their genes aren't on. Um, and they're having this interaction with the material. So let's see. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> no, so what we actually think is cool about this is we've integrated it into a digital process. That means that the second we made this in the incubator, we ran back to the computer and we said, oh my gosh, we can iterate on this. And the, the um, gene expression areas didn't end up in exactly the right spot, so we went back to our CAD program. We redesigned and we realized we could make prediction um, models for where the genes would express. And that way, we now have a CAD program where we can design what we want to make and press print. Um, and so we've made a lot of different experiments in this way and started to branch out into the geometries and the different materials properties that we can work with. And I um, actually want to, do I have one more slide? No, okay. Um, and we've also used a lot of logic circuits in this. So um, the same logic circuits that create um, the types of photographs you saw earlier, we can use to um, combine the logic of multiple signals or inputs that those bacteria are getting and tell them, if you're getting these multiple things, you should produce a signal or a product here. Um, so this was one of our ideas. Um, this is going 10, 100 years into the future for how this could possibly um, be seen in um, a kind of real application. And um, that was, uh, scoliosis back brace, which is already an area that we need to see um, a lot of custom-made um, uh, wear for different patients who have different um, 
kind of backs and different problems. And here we want to use um, bacteria to start to find um, the pain points and the inflammation points and um, produce different um, bioactive drugs for them in those areas. So finally, um, I think this project was a huge mix of design, art, and engineering. Um, one of the places it's ended up is um, the um, London Design Museum and MoMA, um, as well as um, Advanced Functional Materials, which is a publication. So we kind of tried to push on both ends. We realized that putting living cells into objects is going to take a lot of kind of public exposure to get people to be comfortable with it. And first they're going to have to be in these glass cases and like completely pasteurized. And we may have to tell um, TSA that they were salad bowls, but eventually <laughs> um, we can start to use them um, for kind of these functional ideas that you'll think of today. Um, and I'm really excited to see it get there. Thank you. Thank you.